front, we got people in the back, we got people up above, so I guess we're covered. Um, it's a joy to be here with you this morning, and today is a special day. Why is today a special day? It is just Palm Sunday, isn't it? Uh, so my question is, did you put these palms out here for Palm Sunday, or are they always here? They're always there. All right, well, they still function. Look at the palms. It's Palm Sunday. Um, it's interesting today across the world and many, many faiths of many, in many countries, uh, people are celebrating the same thing. Palm Sunday. And on Palm Sunday, of course, we remember Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And we're going to be talking about that today. Thank you for remembering. It was interesting for me as I stand and watch. I preach in a lot of churches of a lot of different denominations. One thing I take note of is which churches carry their Bibles to church and which ones don't. And uh, you get a very good grade, by the way, so I'm not going to ask you to hold up your Bible or hold up your hand, uh, but you actually have them. I've been saying for some time as I've traveled to churches, I'll say, uh, you hold up my phone and, and I'll say, this is not a Bible. And I, of course, get different reactions from people. But now that AI has become a reality and you don't know if what you're seeing ever happened or didn't happen, uh, I think maybe I was right in saying if you only use your, your phone as your Bible, you will never know if the text changes. But if it's written down in your Bible, you will know if somebody tries to change it up on you. So congratulations for bringing your Bibles. Being followers of Christ, that's one of the things that we do. We're people of the book. Palm Sunday, reported in every single one of the four Gospels. In Matthew, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Mark. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Luke 19, 38. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. In John 12, 13, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. If you can imagine that day, what it might have been like as he came into, his, into the city of Jerusalem and the crowd was there and they were shouting. They would have shouted a lot of things. These are the four that are reported, but all focus on one thing. The king has entered the city. So let's pray as we look at that passage this morning and then look ahead to this week that comes, which some call Holy Week, although all 52 should be holy, but this is the week when we look ahead to Easter. Today is Palm Sunday, so would you pray with me, please? Father God, thank you so much that you are in control, that providence, your providence, Lord, is, is, is a part of our lives. I thank you for those who came this morning. I, I'm glad that, Lord, you brought me here. I thank you, Father, for your love and your care that never gives up on me and it never gives up on anyone else. So, Lord, this morning, as we look at, at your scripture, would, would someone be blessed? Would someone be encouraged? Would someone be moved closer into a relationship with you? So, Lord, help me to preach well, and the honor and glory is yours. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to begin by reading uh, from the book of Luke, uh, chapter 19. And I'll be reading from uh, verses 28, actually, all the way to 48. Luke 19, 28 to 48. 
After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day that what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. May we also hang on his words. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. All four gospels record Jesus' And triumphal entry into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. In Matthew, it focuses, uh, the book of Matthew focuses on the Jews and present Christ as king. The book of Mark focuses on the Romans and that's what's written to, and they focus on Christ the servant. The book of Luke it focuses on the Gentiles and, and we see Christ presented here as the son of man and a real focus on his humanity. And in, in John, of course, it's, it's, it's a, uh, a book written to all the Christians with a, with a real focus that, that he was divine. And of course, we know that Christ was both human and divine, but not confused in any way, shape, or form. Now, whenever I go out and preach these days, I, all, I, I try to take a moment to just put in a, a statement about what I call time for truth. We live in an interesting day in our culture in the West, and especially in America, and, um, and, and our worldview changes. And I, you can refer to it as culture, but if you listen to the news, you'll hear the term postmodern thrown out, and uh, postmodern just would really mean that, uh, you know, your truth is how you feel. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment, because that can't be true. Your truth can't be how you feel because I feel different. You might say, I feel that this is my car. And I would say, well, that's fine, but I feel that it is my car. Well, then you would say, well, I feel like I should punch you in the nose. And I would say, well, I feel like I should kick you in the shin. All those things cannot be true. Be careful today as you listen to the news, as you live in the world, as you turn on your phones, and feed yourself a daily dose of TikTok, that you can sort through what is true and what is false. The Bible tells us that truth is more important than feelings, but our culture today tells us that feelings are more important than truth. Be careful. You probably remember the song we used to sing when we were kids, oh, be careful little eyes what you see, oh, be careful little ears what you hear. For the Father up above is looking down in love, so be careful. Be careful, my friends. Uh, ideas have consequences, and bad ideas have victims. Some of those we face today, 
So there's my little be careful. Now let's talk about some truth. And this truth doesn't come from TikTok. It comes from God's word. Palm Sunday was a triumphal entry, but it was a triumph through death. Many of the disciples still didn't get it. The people didn't get it, but Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. Jesus knew as he walked toward Jerusalem from Jericho. He knew. He knew when he was in Bethany the day before. He knew before he entered. He knew what was coming. He knew the praise was false. He knew he would be rejected. He knew he would die. Jesus knew what his death would mean for you and for me. In fact, I might ask you a question. When did Jesus' journey to the cross begin? Ah, before the earth was created, and that's a good answer. And you would be right, it was a part of God's plan all along. One author I read said, the, you could still hear the noise of the apple crunching when Jesus left for Calvary. And we're going to talk about that this morning, but he, he knew. He knew. Let's look at a little perspective of what happened before, both before and after that Sunday, the Palm Sunday. Well, before that, in the days leading up to it, one of the things Jesus does is he heals 10 lepers. The parents bring their children to Jesus for blessing. Now, of course, no one wanted to touch a leper, but Jesus did. The disciples didn't want Jesus bothered with those kids, but Jesus wanted to be bothered with those kids. Then the rich young ruler comes and asks him uh, to be a disciple, and the price is too high, and so he says, no, thank you. And then Jesus foretells his death for the third time. Then here come James and John, and they want the highest places in the kingdom, one on the right and one on the left. And if you do your studies, you'll find it was, they were Jesus' cousins, and so his auntie came, and, he, and she said, now, Jesus, could we arrange this? And he just looked at her and said, you have no idea what you're asking. Jesus then heals two blind men near Jericho. And then, of course, we have the story of another song we used to sing when I was a kid. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. You remember that song? He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the, come on, the Lord he wanted to see. And the Lord said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. And what did Zacchaeus do? He climbed down, and the Lord went to his house. Jesus reaches Bethany, and he's in the house of Simon, the former leper. Can you imagine what it was like to be a leper? Now, I'll tell you that one great joy that I have is, is my, my, my wife. She's a great hugger. Now, she's very small. She's not even five feet tall. But she makes up for it in energy. And I just have thought about being a leper. No one could touch you. You couldn't be within so many feet of your children or your family or your friends or anyone else walking around saying, unclean, unclean. Most of us probably should do that because we are sinners, of course, but Christ has saved us from those sins. But there he is, he's healed, he's back home. I wonder if Jesus smiled when he watched his wife reach out and put her hand on Simon's shoulder and he looked at her and smiled. I'll bet he did. Mary there anoints Jesus' feet and also Lazarus is there, the dead man walking. If you look at that list leading up to Palm Sunday, you have dirty people, innocent people, religious people, insiders, disabled, rich sinners, New man, a new man, a new woman, a dead man. You want to talk about inclusivity? Jesus left no one out. And then came the dame for the triumphal entry. Jesus mounts a donkey. <laughs> That's a servant. Jesus sees Jerusalem and weeps. We read about that 
as a good shepherd would do. Jesus accepts praise and adoration like a king. And then Jesus looks into the temple like a priest, servant, shepherd, king, and priest. After Palm Sunday, the following day, Jesus purges the temple likely a second time, and then he teaches because he knows the clock is ticking. What would you do in the last week of your life if you got that word? Now, my brother, uh, older brother, he's 10 years older, and he was diagnosed some time ago with multiple myeloma. And uh, he said it's gone up and gone down, and sometimes he's better and sometimes he's worse. And he has this saying, I'll say, how are you doing today? And he says, well, I ain't going to be dead until I'm dead. And he go, continues to do things. But all of those conversations that he and I might have missed out on, we didn't miss out on. Because when he got that diagnosis, we sat down and talked. What would you do? Well, what Jesus did, of course, was teach. He didn't have children, not biological children. These were spiritual children. And so he taught them. And likely we would, we would call our children and we would tell them those things that maybe we were afraid to tell them, like, what you're doing is sinful. Stop it. Turn to Jesus. Sometimes we don't tell our children or our grandchildren or our cousins because we want to keep the peace in the family. I think we need to be loving and kind, but telling the truth is never unkind. So Jesus teaches. He teaches about believing prayer. He teaches in the temple. He teaches about the greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Jesus teaches and teaches and teaches, and then Judas betrays him. They gather in the upper room for the celebration, of course, and then they go to Gethsemane where Jesus prays the night away and his children slept. And then he goes to Calvary. But let's take a look a little closer at Palm Sunday. People cheered for the conquering king when he came in, but when he didn't meet their expectations, a week later they yelled, they didn't say Hosanna, they said crucify him. Sometimes when people don't meet our expectations, we quickly go from I love you to I hate you. I like you to I don't like you. We change churches, we change houses, we change. Expectations are crazy, aren't they? And for those of you who are married and have been married uh, more than uh, 20 years, you're the happiest people in America. Did you know that? The report just came out. The happiest people in America are women who have been married 20 years or more and have children. That kind of goes against the old cultural news tag, doesn't it? Do you know who the second happiest people in America are? The men who are married to them. True. It's funny, isn't it, how if you do things God's way, amazing things happen? But when we got married, we had certain expectations, didn't we? And they didn't all turn out that way. Now, don't look at your husband or wife right now, because you know it's true, you just don't want to admit it. Some of it's better than you thought, and some of it's, well, it's just, it's, it's not. But it's good. It's just different than we expected. Well, what do you do when your expectations aren't met? Be careful with that. One week later, later of course, the same people said they, they killed him. But not much really is said about the entry. There's not a lot of commentary in scripture about Jesus as he rode the donkey in, as he arrived, and, and we're not gonna talk about it a lot. I'm gonna change your focus for the rest of this week, I hope. If I'm effective, it'll work. Um, but I do, one comment I do wanna make is, well, someday when I get to heaven, I sure hope to meet the guy that owned the donkey. How in the world did he know to just, yeah, go ahead and take it, no problem. It'd be like handing the keys to your car. Somebody runs, these guys are getting in here. What are you doing with my car there? Well, the owner, the Lord, has need of it. Oh, sure, go right ahead. How did he know? How did he know? And I don't know what you can give, 
but you probably have a donkey that you can give, something that you can give for grace. Give it, do it. He rode a donkey, but we'll look ahead to Jesus' death. You know, they wanted him to ride, they wanted a white stallion, they got a brown donkey. They wanted a ferocious lion, they got the lamb of God. They wanted a warrior king and they got a healing servant. And I'm afraid maybe like us, they wanted, they looked for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But instead they got death, sonship, and a suffering which was eternally better. Look, what I'd really like to try to do now, in, in just a minute, I'm going to do something for seven minutes that I hope you can handle. Now I say I hope you can handle, and 20 years ago that wouldn't have been a problem, but today it is, because did you know that TikTok tried to go with longer little videos and no one would watch them because they were too long? And they were, I think, five minutes. Our attention span, because of social media and because of television, has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter. Uh, advertisements used to be a minute to two minutes long. Now they're maybe 30 seconds if they're that. So everything has changed. But what I want to do is I really want to turn your thoughts towards the death of Christ on the cross because next Sunday we celebrate the resurrection and of course Good Friday comes, which wasn't a Good Friday. It was a Good Friday, it was a bad Friday. But then you got Friday and Saturday and so we take two days out of 365 or 366 and we focus on Christ's death. I think it's worth more than that. Long ago when I was uh, a missionary in Ecuador, I got to be friends over time with actually some um, people, some, some priests, and one day we were having a very spirited theological debate over a cup of coffee. And I can debate anything over coffee. So, and uh, Felix, I said, I just don't get it. You guys in your churches, you got Jesus hung on the cross. He's not on the cross anymore. He's resurrected. And I said, it's a resurrection. We got to be focusing on the resurrection. It's like you guys forgot that he resurrected. And he smiled and he says, well, my friend Dan, I'm, 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 I'm a little bit afraid maybe you guys forgot that he died. Now, I'm not sure that he was right but it penetrated to my inner thoughts and I've thought about that. Do we contemplate the death of Christ and what that meant for us? I don't want to come back here someday to preach and see a crucifix with Christ hanging on the cross, mind you. But do we think about it? Are we grateful? An attitude of gratitude is a major game changer for your life. And so, Having said that, I'm going to read you a story. Now, do you remember when you were a child? Did, did, your, did your mom read you stories? I should ask the kids here, do your parents read you stories at night? And if not, we'd say naughty, naughty to the parents if they don't. But I won't. I don't want you to get in trouble. Listen in for seven minutes and enjoy. We start in the upper room. Then Jesus picked up some bread and broke it. He gave it to his friends. He picked up a cup of wine and thanked God for it. He poured it out and shared it. My body is like this bread. It will break, Jesus told them. This cup of wine is like my blood. It will pour out. But this is how God will rescue the whole world. My life will break and God's broken world will mend. My heart will tear apart and your hearts will heal. Just as the Passover lamb died, so now I will die instead of you. My blood will wash away all your sins and you'll be clean on the inside in your hearts. So whenever you eat and drink, remember, Jesus said, I've rescued you. Jesus knew it was nearly time for him to leave the world and go back to God. It, I won't be with you long. You are going to be very sad, but God's helper will come, and then you'll be filled with a forever happiness that won't ever leave. So don't be afraid. You are my friends, and I love you. Then they sang their favorite song and walked up to the favorite place, an olive garden named Gethsemane. The wind was picking up, blowing clouds across the moon, shrouding the garden in darkness. Stay up with me, Jesus asked his friends. They said yes and waited under the olive trees, but they were tired and soon fell asleep. 
Jesus walked ahead alone into the dark. He needed to talk to his heavenly father. He knew it was time for him to die. They had planned it long ago, he and his father. Jesus was going to take the punishment for all the wrong things anybody had ever done or ever would do. Papa, father, Jesus cried, and he fell to the ground. Is there any other way to get your children back, to heal their hearts, to get rid of the poison? But Jesus knew there was no other way. All the poison of sin was going to have to go into his own heart. God was going to pour into Jesus' heart all the sadness and unbrokenness in people's hearts. He was going to pour into Jesus' body all the sickness in people's bodies. God was going to have to blame his son for everything that had gone wrong. It would crush Jesus. But there was something else, something even more horrible. When people ran away from God, they lost God. It was what happened when they ran away. Not being close to God was like a punishment. Jesus was going to have to take that punishment. Jesus knew what that meant. He was going to lose his father and be separated from him. And that, Jesus knew, would break his heart in two. He sobbed. Then Jesus was quiet, like a lamb, and said, I trust you, Father. Whatever you say, I will do. Suddenly through the trees, a glitter of starlight flashed off steel. In the quiet garden came whispered, muffled voices, clanking metal, and the sound of boots marching. Jesus stood up. He woke his friends. Now is the time, he said gently. Everything that was written about me, what God has been telling his people all through the long years, it's all coming true. And into the night, with burning torches and lanterns, with swords and clubs and armor, they came, an army of soldiers. Judas led them straight to Jesus so they could arrest him. Jesus was waiting for them. Peter leaped up, took a sword, and tried to defend Jesus. He sliced, sliced off a guard's ear. Jesus immediately touched the guard and healed him. Peter, this is not the way. Peter didn't realize that no army, no matter how big, could ever arrest Jesus, not unless Jesus let them. Then Jesus, who had never done anything except love people, was arrested, as if he were a criminal. Jesus' friends were afraid, so they ran away and, I, and hid in the dark shadows. The guards marched Jesus off and took him to the leaders. The leaders put Jesus on trial. Are you the Son of God? They asked. I am, Jesus said. Who do you think you are to call yourself God? You must die for calling yourself the Son of God. Only the Romans were allowed to kill prisoners, so the leaders made a plan. We'll tell the Romans this man wants to be our king, and then they will crucify him. And it would be all right. It was God's plan. It was for this reason I was born into the world, Jesus said. So you're a king, are you? The Roman soldiers jeered. Then you'll need a crown and a robe. They gave Jesus a crown made out of thorns and put a purple robe on him and pretended to bow down to him. Your majesty, they said, and they whipped him and spat on him. They didn't understand that this was the prince of life, of the king of heaven and earth who had come to rescue them. The soldiers made him a sign, our king, and nailed it to a wooden cross. They walked up a hill outside the city. Jesus carried the cross on his back. Jesus had never done anything wrong, but they were going to kill him for the way criminals were killed. They nailed Jesus to the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they are doing. You say you've come to rescue, as people said, but you can't even rescue yourselves. But they were wrong. Jesus could have rescued himself. A legion of angels could have flown to his side if he'd called. Papa, Jesus cried, frantically searching the sky. Where are you? Don't leave me. And for the first time and the last, when he spoke, nothing happened. Just a horrible, endless silence. God didn't answer. He turned away from his son. Tears rolled down Jesus' face, the face of the one who would wipe away every tear from every eye. Even though it was midday, a dreadful darkness covered the face of the world. The sun could not shine. The earth trembled and quaked. The great mountain shook. Rocks split in two until it seemed that the whole world would break. The creation itself would tear apart. After Jesus died, Jesus' friends had gently carried him and they laid him in a new term carved out of rock. How could Jesus die? What had gone wrong? What did it mean? They didn't know anything anymore, except they did know their hearts were breaking. That's the end, the leader said. But just to be sure, they sent strong soldiers to guard the tomb. They hauled a huge stone in front of the door of the tomb so that no one could get in or out. Well, here are some questions that I have for Jesus. And maybe you do too. 
Why didn't you come down off that cross? Why didn't you shut their mouths? Because he could have. Why didn't you blind them? Why didn't you cripple them? Why didn't you give them all leprosy? Why didn't you turn them all into pillars of salt? Why didn't you just destroy the temple? Or move it to Jericho, or Rome, or Spencer? Imagine if the first settlers had arrived here, the white settlers, and they would have said, oh my goodness, that is the temple that was supposed to be in Jerusalem. Now that would have been amazing. Why didn't he do that? Now the answer is pretty obvious, of course, and some of you already know it, but it's because he loves you. I'm not the first one to say it. We needed his death and sacrifice for our sins. He didn't need to go to the cross. It wasn't nails that kept Jesus on the cross. It was love. That's why he didn't come down. Now, I don't know any of you very well at all, really. But Jesus does. And some of you may look in the mirror and say, Ugh. And some of you may think about your insides and your life and your addictions and your habits and say, Ugh. But I want to tell you, in spite of that, Jesus loves you. And someday you'll come to the end of your addiction and you'll seek him out. And when you do, he'll say, hello, my child. Welcome home. Let's stop and think for just a minute. What did Jesus' death accomplish? Well, first of all, it was a substitution. He died in your place. You should have been on that cross. It was also redemption. He took you off the marketplace. You're no longer available. Reconciliation. He made you savable. You were good enough for him to save by what he did. This big, lovely, big word, propitiation. God is satisfied. God was satisfied. And he looks at you now, and he doesn't see your sin. As Corey Ten Boom says, God took your sins, threw it in the deepest part of the ocean, and put up a sign that says, no fishing. God cleansed us from sin and made us clean. It was the end of the Mosaic Law. We don't need, as believers, we don't need the law to tell us what is right and wrong. The Holy Spirit nudges us and tells us what is right and what is wrong. It was justification. We were, we were made complete and, and forgiven. We were adopted. We're the sons of God and we're sanctified, set apart for holy and good works. That's what it did. So in conclusion, I hope, I hope, and it was a bit of a push there to read that story to you, and I thought, I don't know if that'll work, but anyway, here, there it is. But I hope you're thinking about his death this week as you go. Not in a morbid way, but think about what he did for you. Think about how he suffered. Because he loves you. So in conclusion, I say here, it's it, the question. You and I and every person ever born since that time must answer one question. What shall I do then with Jesus? We all must answer it before we die because we will all stand before God and give an account of our lives. The religious leaders in John 18 said, well, get rid of him. Herod looked at it, scratched his head and said, I'll tell you, I'm not. I have no idea, just do whatever you want with him. Avoid him. The crowd at the end, of course, they said, well, reject him, crucify him. But the question of those for Jesus' time was accept him or reject him? Yes or no, as Lord and Savior. And the question for you and for me is the same. Will you accept him? Or will you reject him? Will you say yes to him? Or will you say no? There is no middle ground. Back in the days when I was in Ecuador, I had lots of adventures. And one sticks with me about flying on an airplane. 
I was actually flying from the capital city down to the coast, and so um, uh, we were going to fly on the Ecuadorian Airlines named Tommy, and they actually flew 727s, so it's you know it's a pretty big plane and everything, and so. I was there and I had my ticket and I, you know, I knew what you took in your bag, what you didn't take in your bag, and I was careful about that and everything. And so I got on the plane and, and sat down uh, and as I was sitting there, as we were, you know, the door was closed and then the stewardess came and said, um, are you Dan Winkowich? And I felt like I was in third grade and the teacher was, had called my name and I was daydreaming. And I thought, I wonder why she wants to know why I'm Dan Winkowich. Did I put something in my bag that I wasn't supposed to? Did I do something? Am I in trouble? I mean, what's going to go on? And I'll tell you, just for a minute, I wasn't sure if I was going to say yes, I was, or maybe. All this time, a friend of mine was sitting beside me looking at me like I don't know him. And. Uh, well, I finally said, uh, well, yes, I am. Why? She said, the pilot wants to talk to you, just like that. The pilot wants to talk to me? What does the pilot want to talk to me for? And I said, what? And she said, just follow me. So I got up, followed her up, and came in, stepped in, you know, stuck my head there in the cockpit, and the pilot turns around, and it was Eduardo, a good friend of mine, laughing hysterically. He said, I saw your shiny potato head walking out here to this plane, and I thought I got him. And he said, but hey, since you're up here, the jump seat is open. Why don't you sit up here? You can watch the whole thing, and we can visit once I get up in the air, I'll tell you when to talk and when not. So there I was, man, we took off in that plane, and it was, it was amazing. And landing, it was amazing. And I got off the plane, and my friends there said, what's up with that? You know, I almost didn't answer. I almost didn't answer and missed a delightful, beautiful, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. A bazillion times more important is will you answer Jesus when he calls your name? When the Savior of the universe comes calling, say yes. I almost missed that one too. But I said yes, and this ride is way better than a 727, and imagine what's coming. So this week as you think about his death, think about what's coming, and say yes if you haven't already. And if you have, just keep hanging on to Jesus and walking in this life. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you entered Jerusalem even though you knew what was coming. Father, thank you that you hung on the cross because even though I can't understand why you would love me that much, you do. You did, and you will. So, Lord, I thank you for these, my friends, who are fellow brothers and sisters in Christ as we follow you, Lord. Help us to live for you and be a bright light, to shine brightly in this place where you put us. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.